Hello and welcome to the CS Show. This is your host, Nick Vaidya. Kathy Taberner and Kristen Taberner Siggins are a mother and daughter executive coach team. They focus on the power of curiosity as the critical ingredient for effective leadership. They've seen a huge absence of curiosity in conversations and they say it leads to lack of engagement, accountability, narrowed opportunities, and creates conflict, hinders productivity. Kristen and Kathy have distilled all that they have learned from their extensive work in this area in their book, The Power of Curiosity. They are also founders of the Institute of Curiosity, a coaching and training organization that helps individuals learn and apply the three curiosity skills that give individuals a leg up as leaders, parents, colleagues, friends, and even in conflicts. In our in-depth exploration of negotiation, I found that we are negotiating every day and all the time with business partners, associate, teammates, parents, children, family, friends, and so on and so forth. In a majority of these negotiations, there are no clear solutions. Sometimes we ourselves don't know what we want, and, and the other times the other party doesn't know what they want. Genuine curiosity can serve as a powerful tool in such cases, helping in the act of discovery and creation of better solutions. Kathy and Kristen share powerful anecdotes and insights that illustrate how we can use curiosity as the principal tools of negotiation. So without any further delay, here are Kathy and Kristen for you. So Sounds Kathy good. and Kristen, uh, welcome to the CS show. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you. Good to be here. Wonderful. Now, you know, we're doing a special issue on negotiations and, um, you know, I've, I've been in both sides of the nego negotiations, the academic side, as well as the, you know, the research side, as well as practitioner. And almost all of us have been negotiators, are negotiators. Uh, but the most you learn is from your kids. And I, I recognize that. Um, so what I wanted to see is from a perspective of, um, you know, the business people, can we give them a, a framework that otherwise they would be missing? So what I'm trying to do here is uh, I've talked to a lot of people, CEOs on negotiations. I've talked to Deepak Malhotra. I've talked to, uh, I'm, I'm scheduled to talk with uh, William Uri and so on and so forth. So we're getting a whole perspective and a kind of a framework that I am at this point in, uh, in development. But one of the things I figured out is, you know, people typically think of negotiation as a transaction, you know, the bare bone, bare knuckle kind of negotiation that Donald Trump talks about, which will completely uh, destroy any negotiation if it were internationally between Iran or Britain in the Middle East, because that's more of a collaborative negotiation where you come to an agreement, but that's not the end of it. There is more to it. Mm -hmm. But after reading what you had written, and in some of my conversations, I realized that there's a third element, a non-ending negotiation. It's not just agreements and let's deliver something, but people fail to recognize the, the negotiations that we do on a daily basis with our bosses, with our spouse, with our children, uh, coworkers. And that's, in my view, at least equally important uh, than just the big deals. So I thought, you know, I'll get to talk with you a little bit about that and, and see what you think are the differences and how do we navigate. So that's basically where I am coming from. So I wanted to ask you this question. Do you focus only on kids or, or do you work with others as well? We work with every, we can work with everybody. I mean, because curiosity is, we think the fun, one of the fundamentals of negotiation and we, I think, see any conversation really is a negotiation. So we're negotiating, we negotiate all day, every day in our lives with our kids, with our um, bosses, with our um, colleagues, every, every, in every way, you know, when we're shopping in a grocery store, whatever it is, there's a piece of negotiation involved in every conversation or in most conversations. And, and the kind of negotiation that we're talking about here, where you look at an, an ongoing negotiation or rather a relationship, so to speak, between two individuals or one and the group. That's fundamentally different from what perhaps would be applicable in, in a, a mergers and acquisition situation or even buying a used car. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons because you know, people, people think of negotiation from their perspective and that's why there's no one meaning to the word negotiation. 
I'll give you an example that I just learned um, and, and, and uh, in talking with somebody, she was working as a partner with a like co-CEOs for a hundred million dollar company, now hundred million. And these two partners um, had a shotgun clause, which means, you know, anyone can say, I want to buy you out. And at that point, the other person gets the opportunity to buy out or sell. That's it. That's almost like a divorce. And she went through a um, pretty hell of a time in, in her life because of that situation. I can think of my divorce uh, after 24 years of marriage where you are caught off guard. You, you just don't know what the heck happened. And I can think of another situation where a parents uh, suddenly found their son uh, hanging himself by the rope after he went to Stanford for one semester. Mm. Somewhere things failed. People are smart. Why would such a thing happen? What part of negotiation did they not understand? These are, these are some of the people who, who negotiate for a living. I mean, you know, if you run a hundred million dollar company, you are a negotiator, but you didn't see anything coming. Wanna... Well, you know, I mean, I think also part of what you're talking about is building relationships and, and, you know, as we build relationships, part of the component of that is negotiation, but it's also understanding others. And that's really what we focus on and using curiosity to understand others. So you can negotiate with somebody without understanding what their needs are, or you can have a relationship with somebody without understanding their needs are. But that for us is really the key piece. And that's what I'm hearing you talk about in terms of the negotiation component. And for us, we feel that curiosity plays a huge role in that as a parent, as a spouse, as a person, a colleague, a worker, a manager, a team, whatever, owner of a business, if you don't understand the needs of yourself or you don't understand the needs of others, it's really difficult to build relationships or have successful negotiations. And, and so it's our firm belief that unless you're curious and you ask those questions to better understand people, it's really difficult to have successful relationships and negotiations. I really liked your example uh, uh, with your son, three-year-old son. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'd like you to share it uh, to, to elucidate what curiosity really means. Are you referring to the time with his pants and his toys? Yes. And yes. Well? well, you know, I've had so many uh, moments with my kids who have taught me the importance of curiosity and I'll and I'll get into that quickly but the one quick point I would like to make is that talking with I'm a mother and now my kids are uh, 10 and 8 and so when they were younger, it's a constant negotiation. And now as they're older, it's still a constant negotiation. And it's interesting when you talk to women, most of them will say they're not great negotiators and they don't know how to negotiate, especially mothers who, you know, working or not working, they just feel like that's not a skill that they have, not recognizing that they are literally negotiating every single day with their kids, you know, and doing it really well or not well, depending on the day. But for me, with my son, Alfie, it was, you know, morning I was going to work and it was your typical work day. But in my mind, I had one foot out the door. I had a busy day. You know, it was that ticker tape of things that have to do. And we just had to get going. And he came upstairs and he had no pants on. And it was, you know, this moment where I just thought, oh, we have to go. I'm just super busy. So I said to him, where are your pants? And he said, you know, oh, I need my pants from yesterday. I was like, okay, you know, your pants are dirty. We got to find another pair of pants, go get some more pants and, and we got to go. And he said, no, I need my pants from yesterday. And I was like, okay, I didn't do this right. So I get down on one knee and I think I'm being the star parent. And I look him in the eye and I say, I know you want your pants from yesterday, but your pants are dirty. So can you please pick another pair of pants? We need to go, you know, and I'm high-fiving myself in my head. I think I've nailed it. And he just flips on me and he becomes super mad and super angry. He's like, no, I want my pants from yesterday. I want them, I want them, I want them and starts bawling. He's three. So I, you know, not proud parenting moment. I turn on my heel, I go get the pants from the laundry room and I sort of shove them in his face and say, here, you know, have your pants, we have to go. And he reaches into the pants and he pulls out a toy. He puts the pants down, he puts on a clean pair of pants and you know, through snotty tears is like, okay, I'm ready, we can go. And I wanted, the world to swallow me whole. It was like, no, you wanted your pants and needed your pants in your world for the toy. You didn't want to wear the pants. And I made this assumption and fractured our relationship because I wasn't curious with him to understand why he wanted or needed his pants. If I had just said, how come you want your dirty pants? 
You know, what are you going to need dirty pants for today? I could, there's a million questions that I could have asked and he would have said I needed the toy. But the most powerful moment for me was when I said to him, what could I do differently so this never happens again? And he just said, he looked at me and said, mom, you just could have asked. And I thought even a three-year-old understands the power of curiosity, you know, and he was right. We just ask. And so when we ask those questions to understand the needs of others, you build those relationships. I had completely flat fractured our relationship. I was mad at him. I was angry because I was focused on my needs. I wasn't asking those questions to understand what he needed. And if I had just been curious with him, I would have learned that we would have been out the door quickly. We wouldn't have had that stress fractured relationship. Everybody would have been happy and it would have been a much different morning than the morning that we had. Right, right, absolutely right. Sometimes, um, you know, because of the language barriers, we make a lot of assumptions. And uh, we think in business negotiations, you know, things are crystal clear, but no, even the word negotiation means different thing to different people. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons we're talking about it and getting different perspectives so that we can say, okay, let's look at the word negotiation from a multidimensional perspective and you will discover that there are multiple dimensions. And if, if you are in a negotiation situation, and you always are, you got to know uh, how to react. Because, in, you know, uh, what I'm discovering is, and, and just, <clears throat> just to point out, that there are at least two dimensions. One is the collaboration versus uh, what I call transactional, which is, you know, you, you just buy a used car. You don't have to create a whole scenario, what else can I do for you kind of thing. Whereas in a more complex negotiation, what people want are, are hidden. It's, it's not clear enough what's needed. So you need to get, as you say, cur curious about it and say, let me, before even I make you an offer, let me just go in and truly understand, understand what do you need? How can I help you? Uh, but we get lost, you know, as humans, sometimes we just get lost and we don't ask the question. And I don't know how familiar you're with Marshall Rosenberg, the guy who wrote about uh, nonviolent communication. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's passed, but he has a framework. And fundamentally, it is to say, here are my needs. What are your needs? Um, and it's a simple thing, but it's a change in attitude where every moment you say, look, I need this. What do you need? Yeah. And... Um, I have tried that lately as, as uh, you know, now that I'm studying negotiation for the special issue of the magazine, I'm talking to a lot of people and I've tried these same tricks with my kids. And it is amazing the difference it can make. You can say, this is what I need. And it's so hard to know what you need. Yes, we all know what we don't want, but in most cases we don't know what we do want. And so how can we negotiate for what we want when we don't even know what we want? So that curiosity also goes back into digging deep inside you. What do you really want? Exactly. You know, um, there was an instance when uh, one of the CEOs was, tell was telling me that in a merger situation, um, the bigger company that was acquiring the smaller company was talking about money. And the smaller company CEO was just interested in, when am I going to work? Will I get a corner office or not? And you know they were talking over each other and eventually the deal fell apart but because nobody really understood the needs of this guy was, okay, money is good, but if I'm part of this company, I want the corner office. Am I going to be the co-CEO or not going to be the co-CEO, you know? And this, guy, this person is thinking, okay, so valuation, X millions or billions or whatever, and can I make it more or less? But the other party is not even interested in that. Yeah. So, so how do you become more curious? How do you practice curiosity? Well, we think there are three curiosity skills or skills that make up curiosity. And the first one is to be present. So when, as Kirsten talked about, when she was wanting to go out the door because she was in a rush to get to work and, you know, her mind was thinking about all the things she had to do, she wasn't present in the moment. She wasn't really just there in the moment with her son. So we need to be present in the moment instead of thinking about 10 million other things that, that need to be done so that we can really listen to everything that's being said. And that's not the words, but also body language. It's um, the tone of voice. It's, so we need to stop multitasking and just be present 
to the connection with the other person. The second one is um, choosing how we listen. And we, we believe there are five choices of listening. One being not listening at all. And five being, four and five being listening so that um, we're open to what the other person is saying. And so, so often we are, we listen, but with a judging lens on either um, what they're saying or how we oh, how we see it so it would be the one would be oh I'd never do that oh you know this is such a stupid thing to do I would never I would never this, the the third choice is then about oh, why do they want to do that you know they shouldn't be doing they should be doing it's so judging the other person so the fourth and fifth choices are about being open to just wondering what they what it's all about for them, what their meaning is, what their real want is in terms of negotiation. And you can't do that. You can't, you have to take your judging ears off, so to speak, to be able to be really open to what another is saying. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is to be asking open questions that um, of the other person. So those are questions that start with who, what, when, where, and why, and can't be answered with yes or no. So when we ask a question, you know, how, how can you achieve that? What is your want? What do you need from this? Whatever the question is, then they can't answer that with yes or no. So if I say to you, you know, what is your need right now? It puts you in a place of thinking, okay, what do I need right now? What do I want from this conversation? So we, by asking the questions, we can gain clarity around what the other person's needs are. They can gain clarity, we can gain clarity, so we better understand them. And until we understand what their needs are, and we understand what our needs are, it's pretty hard to move forward because there are assumptions and all other, other kinds of things getting in the way. So getting right down to, okay, what do you need from this? From a child, you know, what do you need from your pants? Or um, what do you need so that you feel safe in this room? Or um, what is it you want to do right now? Whatever it is. Um, parents, I think, in, in the context of parent-child relationship, I think as parents, especially with smaller kids, we really believe we understand, we know what's best for them. And kids are, are being, their, their life is, their world is very different from what, our world was when we were little you know when I was a mom and Kirsten was eight her life wasn't that dissimilar to mine so I had a pretty good idea what was going on in her world but now with technology it's much it's a huge challenge for Kirsten to understand what her eight-year-old is all about and what her experience of the world is because technology has changed the world so much that it, there's not that much similarity so if parents aren't curious with their kids to better understand what their needs are, what they're scared of, how they're feeling about things, they're not going to be able to keep them safe to, to really understand and support them in a way that's going to help them grow up in a way that's going to be best for them. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I come from, uh, immigrated from India and I went to high school over there and my Older daughter, oldest daughter is 16 years old, and often the conversation ends, Dad, you don't understand. Yeah. You never went to high school here. And mm -hmm. I've learned to say, yes, I don't. Help me understand. Yeah. I don't know what it is like. And, and it's been, in fact, a good thing because that's the only answer I can give. Yeah, that's true. I've never been, so I have no idea how the high school is here. And if I try to put on and say, you know, this is how I handle it, you can handle it this way, it's never going to work because... There's no connection. So of late, um, and that's why we move into the next idea. Um, I have developed a connection where she is able to trust me to not be judgmental. And I'm able to communicate with her a incredible more, incredibly more than I could before. Uh, and, and this is post-divorce. Um, because now I, I have full custody and, and I am able, I'm, I'm responsible. So one of the things that I told you, the example of this Stanford kid, again, from immigrant family, the parents didn't know what was going on. And I'm constantly afraid that if I don't have that connection with my children, then I wouldn't know what's going on. They would not open up. They would not talk with me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what can be more disastrous than that? 
Exactly. Uh, even if you send them to Stanford or Harvard, it makes no difference. No. So my question, another one is this. I have noticed that people believe and listen to those whom they trust. Let me give you this example. Uh, my, my brother, for example, often would ask me to talk to my nieces and uh, my niece and nephew to communicate something because he says, I can't do it somehow they listen to you more. And now I have seen to my older brother, can you please talk to my kids because I don't think they listen to me as much. What's the complexity here? Somehow they must be feeling that, you know, either I'm too pushy, not understanding, but I've noticed over the, over the months, uh, in, the, in the last few months, because I've made an attempt to connect, somehow they are more open. So do you find anything there that somehow the kind of relationship affords you the ability to influence more? Well, I mean, I think that we all want to be seen, heard, and understood. It doesn't matter how old we are. I mean, that is what, as humans, we crave, is to be seen, heard, and understood. And as parents, we often want to fix and solve problems for our kids, sort of like what you were talking about. So mm -hmm. it could be an altercation at school, or you know, if your child comes home and says, you just don't get it, you don't understand. And often parents will say, instead of saying, okay, tell me more, or are you right, help me understand. They'll say, you know, well, of course I understand. I went to school. It can't be that bad. You know, I had a hard time at school and I made it through. So you're fine. Or they'll try and fix and solve. And that is not seeing, hearing and understanding. And so that's really difficult to, to build that connection and that trust in a relationship. And I agree. I, I, you're right. I mean, as, as we trust each other, we are become more open with each other. I mean, think about it with our friends, the friends that we trust are the friends that we open up to or the family members we trust are the family members we open up to. And it's, you know, when we meet somebody that we really connect with, we get that feeling of seen, heard, and understood because they listen to us and they ask the questions to want to understand us. So as a parent, all those things are the same for with your children, you know, and, and we always say, I mean, I think for us, the big aha was that we all want to fix and solve and we all want to be the best that we can be. But when we're not curious in a conversation, we're judging and we're telling and we're fixing and we're solving and we're going to that place of I'm right, you're wrong. And we're doing it without even realizing that we're doing it. You know, we think that we're helping and all of that can lead to conflict. The moment that you become curious in a conversation where you see, hear, and understand somebody, where you just, the focus is just on your child as a parent, you might not like what they're saying, you might not like how they're gonna solve the problem, but you're listening to understand what the issue is, how do you wanna solve it, how do you wanna move forward? That's when you learn about your child and that also messages to them that you trust that they're capable of doing it and that builds the trust, you know? And so, so this is a different kind of, tr uh, I wanna differentiate a little bit because looking at from a business perspective, I might trust a highly competent, say, salesperson as VP of sales, or I might trust a highly competent CIO, CTO for their competence, and I will trust their judgment. But the kind of trust you're talking about is, is where does the CIO even understand my, my requirements? Is there a connection? Because oftentimes people feel that the connection between teams is lacking. It's not about competence. You could be an incredibly competent therapist, you could be an incredibly, incredibly competent doctor. And that's why I'd say in, in physicians, one of the abilities is, uh, uh, that's important is to connect with people because you could be an incredibly competent physician, but your um, reputation also depends upon your bedside manners, so to speak. So the thing you're talking about is in, in case of a relationship, the trust is not about competence, but the trust is about you care to understand. Yes. And just to add to that, um, neuroscience is showing us from uh, that um, curiosity, when we're curious and collaborating with it, we're, we're curious to connect with another person, that releases dopamine. Hmm. And dopamine makes us feel good. And then when we continue to have the conversation to connect, it leads to a mind-heart opening which releases oxytocin 
and um, that makes us feel good. But also there's some connection now that's, that they're making between oxytocin and developing trust. So that when we're curious, when we're having this connection, we're asking the questions, we're really listening, we're building trust with the other person on a, from a neuroscience mm. perspective. That's so, right. um, and that leads to collaboration. And it, it's when we listen to another person and understand their wants, their needs, their ideas, their perspective, it's not that we have to agree with it. It's more if we understand it, then we can start looking for the common ground where we can create the commonality so we can move forward in a way that works for both parties. And that can be a child, that can be anybody. And that requires us to ask the question, why? For example, if your son was asking for the, for the dirty pants, uh, the right question would have been, why do you need it? And therefore, it would have been resolved. Um, my question is, Sometimes, and especially in business negotiations, especially when there are hierarchies, boss versus subordinate, it's hard to ask that direct question, why? But when you are genuinely curious, you're not like, why do you need it? It's not like judgmental, why do you need it? But I would like to understand why you need. And that's kind of difficult sometimes to do, uh, especially in a business situation, because are you questioning my authority? And, and are there any other ways to demonstrate curiosity instead of, uh, instead of uh, coming across as arrogant? Well, it's interesting you should say that, and that's a great example you use, because we always say why is a wild card. And if there's any emotion involved, why never start a question with why, for exactly the reason you said. Because if you say, why do you need that? it sounds judgmental versus, oh, why do you need that? You know, I mean, depending on your tone of voice and how you're feeling, but if you say, okay, how come you need that? Or tell me more what, about what you're gonna do with it. Or if you put a who, what, where, when, or how in front of it, it changes how you ask the question. Now, yes, you can ask judgmental open questions, absolutely. Like who spilt the milk? You know, mm -hmm. there are ways of, so it's, it's ensuring that you're coming from a place of genuinely wanting to understand where you're leaving your judgment at the door, where it's, it's approach to better understand the other person. Um, and, and I think that as we're all judgmental, I mean, what I've learned through the work that we've done is we don't realize how judgmental we are. The TV shows we watch are judgmental. The news is judgmental. The conversations we have with loved ones are judgmental. And so we become almost, you know, incapable of listening to it until we're in an emotional situation. And when we're in that emotional situation, then we feel it and we hear it and we see it and it becomes really, really real. But the beauty of it is, is that if you can find, if you feel your emotional buttons being pushed or you feel you're with your boss or you're with your child and you feel, you know, your hairs on your neck standing up, if you can put a what or how in front of those questions to better understand what's going on, it will actually wash away the emotion because you're gonna have a better understanding of what they want and then ask another what or how question. And you will notice if you keep asking questions and you stay present and you remove your judgment, you just focus on what their needs are, it's gonna really help in those emotional situations so you can navigate those potentially conflictual conversations using curiosity in a way where you have like a negotiation, a win-win for each party. So you can understand what's, what's going on for the other person to help you understand where you, what your needs are and how you fit in together. And sometimes um, the other party may not be, um, cognizant of the methods of communication. They may have lived a life where they're reactive or whatever have you, where, where their interaction style is immediately an expl explosive style, so, so, so to speak, where they're presuming things. And so it becomes even more important to have patience and curiosity to say, let me express to you how I work. And once they see, oh, you work this way, then they will trust that, okay, you're not being judgmental, you're actually being genuinely curious. So it, it probably takes effort and time and, and energy to, to see how the other person is. But your child, probably the child knows how you are. You may want to change and you can change, but let's say your niece or your nephew or somebody else uh, who's from a different environment and different behavior patterns, 
would you need a lot of patience or can you establish that fairly quickly that no, I'm different. I, I don't behave that way. Well, I'm just going to jump out. I'm going to throw it to you, but yeah. just one quick thing. It's, it's interesting that you say that because parents have to understand the difference between being nosy and being curious. So, cause kids know the difference right away. You know, I spoke to a parenting expert about this and she was asking about, you know, how do you navigate this world? Just like you're saying of being curious with your kid, because let me tell you, your teenager knows when you're being nosy and she knows when you're listening to be curious. And I think parents have to understand the difference as do everybody else when you go into a conversation and it's how you approach the conversation where, you know, you're, you're coming from that non, you're leaving everything. I mean, true curiosity holds no judgment. You are just open to learn about the other person. And you can hear that in a conversation. When you start modeling that, I want to see you, I want to hear you, I want to understand you with your kids, that's the language that they're going to learn. And that's the language they're going to use as they get older. And it's, it's, a, it's we do what our parents do, not what our parents say. We do what our leaders do, not what our leaders say. Mm -hmm. It's that same concept. But if you can approach any conversation from, even if somebody is coming at you emotionally, you know, really hard, if you can stay in that non-judgmental, okay, I'm going to ground myself and keep asking the how and what questions, their emotions will dissipate as well because we kind of mirror each other. And there's neuroscience that proves that, which I will let you speak to if you want to, because you're better at the neuroscience than I am. But it is a fascinating thing that we often believe that we're being curious when in fact we're being nosy because there's judgment attached to it. Like, who are you going out with? Are you going out with that whatever kid again? You know, and, and questions, a lot of parents also ask closed questions thinking they're being curious, but it leads to a very closed, narrow, judgmental conversation. And that happens in the workplace as well. So it's remembering to leave your assumptions, test your assumptions, leave your judgment at the door and just be open to learn and focus on the other person. I think, I think no, I just wanted to reinforce, I think that's the key. Our society seems to be so, we need to talk about our needs, about our this, our that. There only is one perspective that I have and it's mine. And in, I think where we need to switch that is that each one of us has our own perspective. And unless we focus on the other person, we're not going to get there. So, when, and that's the same with uh, being nosy. I need to know. I'm judging. I need to know what's going on for you. No, I just want to better understand you. So I need to know so that I can understand the gifts you have, the person you are, so I can be there for you. And and that it's it's very subtle, nuanced, but it's a huge shift mm -hmm. in how we think as a society. You know, there's a great example uh, just to let you know, and also the audience. And I've talked about that example elsewhere uh, between the uh, the negotiations between the NFL players and the owners or union. I don't know exactly who. Some 11 billion dollars worth of uh, value was at stake, and the whole thing was falling apart in 2011. And the solution proposed was completely unacceptable until they changed a little bit about the way to see things. And so the deal that was accepted eventually was fundamentally no different from the original. It's just that one acknowledged the needs of the other side and others did not. Yeah. And it's just that that alone made a difference. Let me, let me, as you were talking, I was thinking about something. When are we most curious? When are we most uh, willing to listen to somebody? When are we most wanting to understand somebody? And as strange as it may, not strange, but as trite as it may sound, it's, it's when you are courting, when you're in a courtship, initially you meet a person, you like a person, and everything about that person fascinates you, and you just wanna know more. And I'm thinking in terms of how do you train to be that way with every situation? How do I, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy enough to understand cognitively, yes, you need to ask a question, you need to be curious, but how do I get to be curious? And so the best thing is to role model situations where you're genuinely curious. And what's going on in that situation? And I'm thinking, well, you respect that person, you like the person, and that person is more important to you at that moment than your own self. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, maybe other things also, but it just occurs to me that, you know, it's not so hard to do. Everybody knows to do it. Mm -hmm. We just don't do it in other situations. 
Well, we believe we're all born being curious. I mean, when you say, when are we most curious? I, I we've talked, Kathy and I have talked about this a lot and, and we feel, look at a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. I mean, it's constantly, I want to touch, I want to feel, I want to talk, I want to ask questions. I mean, there's, as kids, we are all so crazy curious. We are not judgmental. We don't make assumptions. You know, we haven't learned. Those are all learned behaviors that we get as we grow older. As parents, you know, it becomes like, oh, stop asking questions. Don't touch that. Do this, you know, moving kids from place to place to place. And so we just shut down that, you know, excitement for curiosity. You get to school, they isolate us, they test us, they don't want to ask quite. I mean, you can see the pattern going. And then you come out of school and you need to be a manager and lead a team and you need to collaborate and you need to innovate. And at that point, most people will say, well, just tell me what to do. And it's like, no, we're hiring you so that you can figure it out. But prior to that, all of the years prior to that, we've been told what to do by our parents, by our teachers, by our coaches, by our whatever. And we come out the other end and there's this expectation that we know how to collaborate and communicate all skills that, yes, we're born with, but they're not things that we teach our children or whoever. You know, we're not, we don't learn how to listen. We don't learn how to ask questions. We don't, yes, we have the ability to do them, but the reality is, is very few of us ever listen. Very few of us are actually present in our life and actively listen to others. And even less people ask questions and we deal with that in a workshop. You know, it's really terrifying for people to ask open questions because they're not used to asking those questions. What if people judge me and think I don't know the answer? You know, what if they think I'm not a good leader? If I ask my team an open question, then they'll think I don't know the answer and I won't be a good leader. So it's just better for me to tell them what to do. Well, how do you understand the needs of your team if you don't ask the question? How do you understand the needs of your child if you don't ask those questions? So, you know, we've spent a lot of time looking at this. There's very little research on curiosity. And the, the coolest part is, is that because we're born with the ability to be present to actively listen, to choose to listen without judgment and ask open questions, we have the ability to be curious anytime, anywhere, with anyone. We just have to relearn the language on how to do it. And that's the hard part because we're all, you know, especially as we get older, you know, we do what our parents do. So how many times do you find the voice of your parents coming out of your mouth when you get frustrated with your children? Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. This is wonderful because um, you know, the cornerstone, there are very few cornerstones in negotiations fundamentally, you know, it's, it's not such a hard thing, but when, but, but being able to do something and knowing how to do are completely different things. And, and you need practice, you need presence of mind when you're required to change your own behavior. But the consequence is humongous. I mean, the consequence for those parents who's whose uh, son committed suicide. I mean, that, that's incredible and, and nothing can be bigger than that. But there are many others where you lose business deals and multi-million dollar deals. And, and if you don't learn how to negotiate, which boils down to a few tenets, it's not like you need to learn to negotiate like Donald Trump or, or you know, you do need to know that as, those things as well. Like the, what, what I call the, uh, the tactical side of negotiating where elements of deception are in place. That's also needed, but this is also needed. You need to know where to deploy which one. But at the core of it, as, as you said, is, is the idea of getting to know truly what's going on here. Because if you don't know what you're doing, I call it the general Custer moment when you don't know what the heck you're doing and you go, go to uh, fight with 5,000 warriors with 250 people, you get decimated. And, uh, you know, or with your child without knowing what, what the child needs. If you insist and emphasize, you make mistakes and those can be terrible mistakes. So thank you so much. You go, I just want to add one quick thing is that yeah. I think that, you know, parents also, I learned this, my dad is a negotiator and he taught me something that was so profound for me when my kids were young and going back to what you were saying, yes, the understanding is important, but I think as parents, when kids ask the questions constantly, can I have a cookie? No. Can I do this? No. Can I do that? No. You know, whatever it is, they stop having the ability to ask for what they want because they just hear no or shut down all the way. So as they grow older, they stop asking those questions. Even though they might know what they want or know what they need, they won't ask for it because they 
know that it's not going to get them anywhere. And so for parents, if you're out, you know, every once in a while, and this is what he taught me, and it's, it's changed my view with my kids because they're incredible negotiators. Give them what they ask for, you know, or negotiate, you know, I want to have a cookie. Okay, how many cookies do you want? Well, uh, you know, very rarely do you get to that point in a conversation. Normally it's no or yes, you know, and then they take two and you're mad because you wanted them to have one or whatever. So how many cookies do you want? I want to have three, you know, and so maybe it's like, okay, well, three sounds too much. How about two? Great. They get the cookie. You get to have two, right? You have the understanding of your need and theirs, or I want to have a cookie. Okay. How many cookies do you want to have? Three. Because you asked for three, you can have three. And that instills the confidence of, I asked what I wanted and I got what I wanted. And then they will continue to ask those questions. And you, they learn that you can get what you ask for. And I think as parents, we don't see that these skills start when they're kids. And how we parent them is how they're going to turn to a leader or how they're going to turn to their manager because it starts at home, right? Kids do what we do, not what we say. So the more that we can be curious and we can ask those questions and better understand them, especially in these negotiations that happen every single day, give them a win every once in a while so they know what that feels like. It might not be, you know, you pick and choose where you know what your boundaries are as a parent and they get to have what they want. But that will really help them as they get older, especially in a work setting, to learn how to ask for what they want. This is so incredibly interesting and uh, empowering. The conversation I wanted to really go into was not just about kids, but about negotiation. But, you know, as parents and anybody else who listens, most people would be a large percentage would be parents. So this is important. I recently did something different with my kids and, you know, having full custody of three daughters, eight, 12, and 16 has changed me completely. Uh, <laughs> I cannot begin to describe the details, but late, of late what I'm doing with my daughter is, let's come to, here's, here's what I need. Here, I need you to learn to be, really go into the needs. And I said, I need you to learn to be responsible, capable, independent by 18. When you leave the house, that's what, that is how I measure my success. So help me do that. Tell me what you want, what you need. Let me explain to you what I need. And maybe we can come up with some uh, situation, uh, you know, scenarios. And here's what happened just, just yesterday. So we talked about, you know, cleaning the room and she agreed. I did not play any deceptive tricks, but so sort of, I, you know, she didn't know what she was getting into. And then, you know, she wanted to get out of that. So I said, look, it was your decision. I don't make those decisions. You make decisions and you're 16. I'm not going to make decisions for you. I'm going to help you make decisions. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enforce those decisions that you make. And, <laughs> and it's, it's just like, wow, she's listening to me. And just about a year ago, year and a half ago, there was all nothing but screen matches in my house mm -hmm. because I just didn't know how to deal with her. And um, one thing I, I realized is uh, at the core of besides curiosity, is also the element of really respecting a human being no matter what. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you go with that attitude, that you genuinely, truly respect the other person's right to be the way they are, as long as they don't hurt you, and if they do, then you get out of the way. Everything around the the relationships and your success rate and everything seems to change. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we don't talk about that, that respecting others is not just about, you know, some, some kind of a social construct, but it is, it is the, the, the lubricant that, that makes everybody come together and work together. And if you don't respect, that's like two people uh, are going to have trouble, you know, if you're not respectful. Um, and that seems to be, it's not, it's not talked about anywhere, but I think if you go into a negotiating situation with respect, I have no research to prove this, not to back it up. Uh, there isn't any, nobody has done that. But I think conceptually, I would theorize that that should work. And, and to us, I think respect comes from really listening to someone. If we don't listen, if we're not listening to the person who's talking, how are we messaging respect? It, respect comes from being open and not judging them. Respect comes from that digging deeper and really wanting to understand them. So, yeah, we would agree with you completely Absolutely. on that. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Wonderful talking with you. Great ideas. And I'll be back in touch. Thank Thanks, you. Nick.